Good afternoon and welcome to Fortress Press Live, where we connect you with the people and passions behind the books we publish here at Fortress Press. Our guest today is Laurel Kev Taylor, and we'll be talking about her book, Give Me Children or I Shall Die, Children and Communal Survival in Biblical Literature. Laurel, thanks for being a part of this episode of Fortress Press Live. Thank you. Well, why don't you take a few moments and introduce yourself to the Fortress Press Live audience? My name is Laurel Kef Taylor. I'm assistant professor of Old Testament at Eden Theological Seminary, which is a UCC seminary in St. Louis. Give Me Children or I Shall Die, Children and Communal Survival in Biblical Literature is a revision of my PhD dissertation, which I did at Union Theological Seminary in New York. Well, and as you mentioned, today we're going to be talking about your book, Give Me Children or I Shall Die, uh, which is a part of Fortress Press's Emerging Scholars series. Now, I know some of our listeners aren't necessarily going to be familiar with this series, so let me take a moment to share a brief description. Emerging Scholars is a curated, selective dissertation series dedicated to highlighting innovative and creative projects from new scholars in the fields of biblical studies, theology, and Christian history. And as of the time of this recording, uh, we currently have 46 volumes available in the series. Now, as many of our academic listeners will already know, when you choose a dissertation topic, you're setting yourself up to eat, sleep, and breathe that topic for a long time. Uh, (laughs) So I'd be curious to hear how you got started, what got you interested in the field of childhood studies? Thank you. I began working in childhood studies because previous to my work on my master's and PhD, I was in children's ministry. And throughout my master's and even into my PhD, I found myself being the only person in the room who was asking questions about children and childhood. And as I asked those questions, I found that they deepened and added new layers to whatever conversation I was having with my colleagues, whether that would be an ethicist or a liturgist or a historian or a biblicist. And so I began to do additional research to try and discover if there were others asking similar questions to mine. What I was delighted to discover was that in those years, a new field was beginning to develop called childhood studies, where people were asking questions about children and childhood of a wide variety of fields and making the same discovery that I was, that as we ask questions about children and childhood, we find new conversations that need to be had in each of our fields. And so I began to bring what I was discovering in researching what others were saying in childhood studies into my work in biblical studies, and it really became very fruitful. So in that way, I was able to take something that I was already passionate about and also fill in uh, what I perceived as a real need in biblical studies while entering into a new and exciting field. In the book, you talk about three previous approaches or three existing approaches Mm. for childhood studies, but you suggest a possible fourth approach, which you refer to as a sort of coffeehouse model for childhood Mm -hmm. studies. Talk to us about that approach. The reason that I talk about a coffeehouse model, and that's instead of a clearinghouse or a pick and mix or a rebranding, is that as an interdisciplinary field, Childhood studies has several different directions it could go in. And as, an, as a new field, there's still an open conversation about what the field can be. One of the things it could do would be collect information about children and childhood and conversations about children and childhood from other fields and become a place where all of those things come together. And that's certainly useful. But by talking about a coffee house, I want to point out that something in addition to that collection is taking place within childhood studies, and that is that people are having valuable conversations that not only grow childhood studies, but also grow all of the other fields that childhood studies is drawing from, in the same way that historically a coffee house has done, uh, whether or not that's what actually happens when you walk into a Starbucks today. But historically, a coffee house was a place where people from different disciplines, people from different fields would be able to have these fruitful conversations with one another and really begin to grow what they were doing in their own work from hearing what someone else was doing. I recently heard that the shift to people gathering in coffee houses was a shift from gathering over wine to gathering over coffee, which really makes a great deal of sense in shifting from the communal beverage being a depressant to being a stimulant that you are able to have stimulating conversations 
in that way. And that's what I see childhood studies doing, really stimulating conversations among scholars by bringing this new topic into conversations that were already taking place. All right. Well, thank you for that explanation. Next, talk to us about the idea of childhood being socially or culturally constructed and why an understanding of that really holds a lot of promise for enhancing biblical studies. So this is really one of the primary contributions of childhood studies. One of the ways that childhood studies differs from some of the other fields that have historically talked about children and childhood. Uh, For example, children's literature and developmental psychology have talked about children for a long time. One of the ways that childhood studies differs is that it talks about childhood as culturally constructed. This means that we recognize, of course, that there are children and that there are real differences between young people and older people. But just as when people talk about gender or race as culturally constructed, we recognize that there are differences among people, but the ways in which we make meaning out of those differences are a part of our culture, are created by our culture, and are not universal. What the various differences among us signify are things that our cultures decide and that different cultures decide differently. Where we draw the lines to create categories among these differences could be done in a variety of ways. So when we talk about childhood as culturally constructed, we differentiate between children, that being people who are young, and childhood, the ideas that a culture creates about what it means to be a child and who exactly is defined as a child. The cultural construction of childhood is specifically that idea of how we define what children are, the ideas we associate with them, and the recognition that we could, just as many other cultures have done, make a different set of assumptions about children and that those sets of assumptions become so culturally powerful, become the water we swim in, the air we breathe, that we adapt to those assumptions, that children learn to be children in the way we expect them to be. And that in different times and places, when there are different expectations, children learn to be children in very different ways. One of the things I found really fascinating in the book is there was some talk you gave briefly on different sorts of, I want to say grave sites, but children of different ages were treated differently in burial. Give us a little commentary on that. This is some of the really exciting archaeological evidence that has been helpful in trying to understand ancient constructions of childhood. So it seems that some of the categories that we can discern come, uh, we can look at these by looking at how children were buried, because unfortunately, many children died very young in the ancient world. There are particular varieties of graves in some areas of the Levant, where you see, for example, infants buried in jars, usually in or near the home. And you see adults buried in family tombs. And in between those two definitions, you also see children, people in between infancy and adulthood, buried on their own, neither in the family tomb nor in a jar in the home. And there are approximate age separations between those categories. For example, the separation between infants and children seems to be around two or three, which also is what was likely at the time of weaning. And so what we see there is that life stages rather than age can define the difference between infancy and childhood in the same way the separation between those who are buried in graves on their own and those who are buried in graves with the family in the family tomb seems to be around 12 or 13, which is likely to be the onset of what today we would call adolescence, although clearly that's a very new and culturally constructed category. But these shifts in bodies are not things that happen on the clock on a particular birthday. And this is also something we see cross-culturally today, that in many non-Western cultures, they don't have the same focus on their birthday and their age. When we meet children in our modern Western culture, often the first question we'll ask them is, how old are you? Because we know that we base so much on age 
that you can find out a great deal about a child from asking how old are you. We associate it with particular developmental categories or where they are in school or what particular life stages we expect for them to have taking place. But if you ask children in many other places, how old are you, they wouldn't know because they don't have to fill out forms all the time that say that. So we have very different definitions in the ancient world, and this is reflected in the archaeological record. This is just one of the ways that recognizing the cultural construction of childhood can be really fruitful in biblical studies. Because cultural constructions are so powerful for us today, it's all too easy for us to assume that when we read the Bible, that when it mentions a child someone who's ca- or someone who's categorized or a child or as young, that our cultural assumptions about childhood will apply to that person, when really an ancient culture would have had a completely different set of cultural constructions, and recognizing that can help us avoid falling into anachronism. Yeah, it's always a challenge. I think, you know, initially we always want to read our own experience and read through our own lenses, but we have to really be conscious of the context when we're uh, reading the Bible and and other ancient documents as well. Uh, Another part of the book that I really found intriguing was your talk about the differences in the value of children, how a child might be perceived as valuable, per se, Mm -hmm. in a modern context versus how, you know, what was the value of a child uh, in Hebrew times? And I'm not talking, you know, like, monetary value per se, or or something like that. But uh, another very fascinating part of the book. Talk to us about that. A lot of what I talk about is the contrast between a child as valuable and a child as priceless. And those are nuances that express some of the differences in how we think about children as valuable. You You mentioned placing a monetary value on children. I can't tell you exactly the monetary value of a child in the ancient world. But what I can say is that it's likely that children were understood to be economically valuable in a very different way than we think of children today. This comes out of a shift that we experienced in our culture just a hundred years ago or so when we began to have child labor laws and began to place a cultural taboo on placing an economic value on children. This cultural taboo isn't reflected cross-culturally today, and it certainly wouldn't have been reflected in the ancient world, in which, in a subsistence agricultural context, children would have been absolutely necessary, not just for their own survival, but for the survival of the entire family. We think of children as our dependents. We list them as our dependents on our taxes. But ancient families were interdependent. Men, women, and children all needed one another and the work that each of these people provided for the survival of the entire family. And this is key for understanding the contrast between modern and ancient conceptions of childhood. We see our children as having emotional value, sentimental value, as being priceless. You could never put a price on a child. And this has been reflected in multiple shifts throughout history, not just in child labor laws, but in adoption practices also. Today, People will be on long waiting lists and go to a great deal of of expense to try to adopt an infant, while older children in foster care have a great deal of difficulty finding a family. In contrast, just over 100 years ago, infants without parents or who had been given up for adoption, people who had had infants and did not want to keep them would pay someone to take the infants off of their hands. The people who would do this were called baby farms. They would be paid to take infants off of people's hands. Whereas older children, specifically older boys who could do farm labor and older girls who could provide child care, would be adopted quickly. And this is a huge contrast between today and then, not even taking into account the greater distance between today and the ancient world. These economic shifts that shape our cultural constructions of childhood are relatively recent. Now, you focus on a number of different topics throughout the book, including infertility and the the long-term survival prospects of parents, children as a means of cultural reproduction, keeping culture moving along through time, and the idea of, you know, that if somebody was threatening a child or threatening children, that really, that was an assault on on the future or long-term viability of that community. Uh, Give us some of the the context for some of these ideas and, and talk about how they really should be impacting our understanding of biblical texts. Certainly. 
I begin by talking about fertility and infertility, and this is certainly a prominent theme throughout Scripture. When you think of the multiple women who are described as barren and then come to have children, there has, of course, been a great deal of research since it's such a prominent theme. What I'd like to add to what's been said about this particular theme is that it's not just that these women are seeking the status that comes with motherhood or that they are seeking to have children in competition with one another, although we certainly see those elements, but also that the children they are seeking to bear represent wealth and survival for the family, that fertility in an agricultural context is a form of wealth and a source of survival. And this isn't limited to growing crops, and it isn't limited to breeding animals, but also the people, the children who from the age of two or three were likely to have provided labor that was vital to the family was something that was economically valuable. And this relates directly to this this contrast in constructions of childhood, that the labor that children did was not chores. When we talk about children doing work today, because we have such a cultural taboo against thinking about children as people who work, we depict it very differently. We describe it as chores, and we describe it as educational or for the children's own good so that they can build characters, so that they can learn to do these things, so that they will know how to do them when they get older. The activities that children do in a subsistence agricultural context today and that children would have done in the world that gave us the Bible was not practice, was not educational, was not for the purpose of building character, but instead That's labor that's essential for everyone's survival. And in that way, when we see women and families experiencing infertility, the struggles they have are not only the kind of emotional struggles we're familiar with people having today, but also a vital economic concern, and not just for themselves, but really a communal concern for everyone's survival. The next topic that I cover is related to education and enculturation. Now, education is a topic that we today are very familiar with associating with children. We have children today who spend most of their time, children today spend most of their time in an educational environment. But education served a different purpose, and there's nuance to this in the ancient world. I speak about this in the book, particularly in the context of exile and diaspora. Although certainly it applies in other contexts, I think it's particularly poignant in this moment. Because in the moment of exile, a former cultural elite becomes culturally threatened. They become a cultural minority, and they experience the fear that they will not culturally survive. They have survived the conquest and gone into exile, but they have a fear that their culture will not continue. In this time, we begin to have a preponderance of texts that assert the importance of teaching children, of passing tradition on to children. Now, especially if we consider those who went into exile to be the remnant of a scribal elite who knew themselves to be culturally formed by the texts they have memorized, they're seeking to culturally form children through the memorization of texts. And in that way, to experience cultural survival through children, they are seeing education as a way of depending on children. This is where the difference comes in between our understanding of education and this ancient understanding of education. When we talk about sending children to school, about having children get an education, we talk about it for their benefit. Children will get an education so that they will succeed in the future, so that they will be employed in the future. And this is not to say that the education children received in the ancient world wouldn't have been helpful to their future success, or to say that the education we provide children today doesn't form them culturally. But the real difference is the idea that's culturally dominant. The idea that's culturally dominant about education today is that it's for children's future success. The idea that's culturally dominant in the context of exile and in the ancient world is that children's education accomplishes the future success of the community, the future success of the culture and its ability to survive. And when we recognize these contrasts, we can also note that this is something that we can look to accomplish. 
as we look today at some of the economic shifts that we've had in our country and in Western culture in general, you'll notice that there's been something of a shift in the parenting literature as well, where you see people focusing more on children needing productivity and grit and resilience instead of the former parenting literature about self-discovery. And so we can really note that the economic shifts that we experience today, similar to the economic differences between our lives today and those of people in the ancient world really are reflected in different constructions of childhood. The final piece that I bring in in my book is regarding the attack upon children and the threat to children, particularly in the event of war. Now, threats to children, we viscerally experience today as people who understand children as priceless, as emotional threats, threats to the priceless innocence of a child. And when I talk about threats to children in the ancient world, I'm not saying that people didn't have an emotional attachment to their children or that they wouldn't have experienced that kind of emotional threat, but that additionally, when we look at how much adults were dependent on children for their cultural survival, as I talked about in speaking about education and enculturation, and for the family's agrarian survival in the context of children's work within the family, any threat to children in the event of war would have appealed to the adult's knowledge that they were dependent on their children and was a threat to the future of the community, both in their day-to-day survival and in their cultural survival. And so we can read each of these pieces differently when we recognize the nuances of the differences in constructions of childhood between the modern and the ancient worlds. Laurel, if readers could only take away one thing from Give Me Children or I Shall Die, as the author, what do you most hope they come away with? I would say the most important thing for people to take away from this is that you can't assume when you encounter a child in Scripture that that child is how you remember your childhood or that the ancient author's understanding of what a child is and what childhood is is anything like your perception of childhood. The children in the, in the Bible are not meant to be depicted as people of leisure, people who play, but instead that they're absolutely necessary for the survival of the ancient family. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, if the listeners are interested in picking up a copy of Give Me Children or I Shall Die or learning about other books in the Emerging Scholars series, you can visit our website, which you can find at fortresspress.com. Laurel, thanks so much for being generous with your time today and for being a part of this episode of Fortress Press Live. Thank you so much for including me. Thanks for being a part of my conversation today with Laurel Kepps Taylor. To view the show notes for this episode or to leave a comment, head over to fplive.fortresspress.com forward slash 010. While you're there, be sure to check out other episodes of Fortress Press Live and subscribe to the show via SoundCloud. Until next time, this is your host, Sean Tabbitt, signing off.